So in this topic, so the fourth topic of the session, we're going to look at particular assets. Um, and we're going to look at some of the elements and some of the issues in relation to these particular assets. So we're going to look at um, three particular types of assets. We're going to look at receivables, we're going to look at inventory, and we're going to look at non-current assets. And there are certain elements of things which we're going to look at them. Some of these things we've actually covered in a large part already. So some of these things we actually, for the most part, know. But there's certain of these objectives where when we go into it a little bit more detail, they add in, some, add in a little bit of complexity to where we're already at. So if you look at the first three, these first three objectives all relate to accounting for receivables. So accounts receivable, um, firstly, how do we record them? And we know that. So first bit is straightforward. But there's an issue with receivables, as we'll get to in two and three, in that a receivable represents that someone owes us money. And when someone owes you money, there is no guarantee that they're going to repay you. Most people will but not everyone will. And that's the issue that we have is, firstly, how do we account for that? So what are the entries and when do they happen? And secondly, how much do we do? Because when you think about it, the sale amount we know, we sell $100,000 worth of material or $100,000 worth of um, not of material, $100,000 worth of sales, we make that, and we have $100,000 owing to us. That we know. What we don't know, because it's gonna happen in the future, is what proportion of those people are gonna pay us and what proportion of those people aren't. That's a future piece of information. So that's something we don't know with certainty now. We're gonna to have to make an assumption about it. And that is, it is gonna be an assumption. So what are the entries and when do they happen? And secondly, how much? So those are the critical things we're looking at in relation to receivables. In relation to inventory, inventory we've come across and we've done the accounting for it. We've actually done the basic entries for it already. So when we buy inventory, which is something that we want to resell to someone else, we debit inventory and credit cash or credit accounts, accounts payable. So we have purchased it in. Then when we sell it to someone else, we debit cost of goods and we credit inventory to show that the inventory came in and then the inventory has gone out. So inventory, we, we already have a sense of what it is. We also have a sense of how we record that flow through. But there is an assumption that we make that we, can, uh, that we have quite a lot of knowledge about the cost of what we sell when we sell a particular item. So when the university bought this from whichever supplier they bought it from, and whichever supplier they bought it from bought it from Logitech, because it's a Logitech clicker, people were aware exactly how much this, this very one cost. That may or may not be true. So we want to have a look at what we do if it is true, and we know exactly how much this thing is, and we want to know what we do when we don't know how much this exact, not just one that's like this, this exact one that I have in my hand. Um, so we'll kind of, we'll look at that and why that's important um, sort of midway through. And the last three, describe property, plant and equipment. Um, we're standing in some, I'm standing, you guys are sitting in property, plant and equipment. You guys are sitting on property, plant and equipment. You guys have your laptops on property, plant and equipment. You know, so we, we'll look at it in a more formal sense. Again, how we bring it in and, and how we deal with it after the fact. Um, we've touched on this already. But we haven't looked at how we come up with those depreciation numbers. Although we did, I think we had a bit of extra time last week, so we did start to talk about it. We're going to put some more detail around that. And lastly, how we sell something off. So just to give you some context, I figure it's always good to talk about these things in context. So this is so this is Woolworth's annual report. So this is their latest annual report. So this is, you guys should have a copy of it somewhere. Um, I think you guys have to go um, and look it up. 
You don't, you don't need to necessarily take any information down from this. If you do have a copy, please go and have a look at it sometime at home. But I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of numbers here. So if you can see sort of midway through, we've got current assets and we've got non-current assets and total assets are about $23.5 billion. So total assets is about $23.5 billion. Now the assets that we're going to be specifically talking about today and elements of them are firstly receivables, which there are current trade and other receivables. So there are current assets of about three quarters of a billion dollars and there are non-current assets of them uh, under a hundred million, so not too much. So it's about three quarters of a billion dollars of receivables. So, you know, it's, just, it's not a huge amount of Woolworths business, but of Woolworths assets, but it's not immaterial. Um, but also when you think about Woolworths as a business, like when most of us go in and shop, we just pay them. So it makes sense given the type of business that it is that they wouldn't have that many receivables. Um, the second thing we're doing is inventory. Inventories for Woolies, 4.6 billion current. And that's, sometimes you see non-current inventories, which is a bit strange, but we don't. So $4.6 billion of their assets are inventories. Given that it's a retailer, given that it's a supermarket chain, that makes sense because that's what they do. They sell inventory. The last thing we're looking at today is property, plant and equipment. Property, plant and equipment, about 8.2. So that's about, that's about half of their non-current assets and about a third of their total assets. So the things that we're talking about today, the 8.2, the 4.5, so that's about what, 12, round up to 13, plus the receivables. We're talking about a roundabout for Woolworths, about $14 billion worth of their assets. So it's not like these are small kind of things. Um, the other big asset they've got is intangibles, but we're not going to be talking about that today. So just, just to provide some context. Okay. So in terms of the first thing, what is a receivable? So you look at somebody's balance sheet. Chikai knows this. It's that you have sold something to somebody and somebody owes you that money. So it represents, an account receivable represents your claim on the assets of somebody else. So credit sales drive this, um, sometimes known as trade receivables and we've just seen that with, um, with Woolworths. Really easy entry, debit account receivable credit sales revenue. So that's one we've done a bunch of times before. So there's nothing new in that. But as I've already mentioned, and as you guys should be thinking about, that if we see that in the balance sheet, if we see accounts receivable, that tells us at that date, if $1,000 is the balance at the end of the year, we expect or the company expects to be able to collect $1,000 but it's really unlikely that you're ever going to be able to collect everything from everyone that owes you money. And it's not just because they didn't want to pay. Sometimes they run into financial difficulties and they just can't pay. So it's not always because they, they had no intention of doing so. So what we need to have a look at is, well, how do we deal with this problem? Because it is an issue. It is something that happens. And it's not always with a lot of these things, there's not always just one way in which you can do it. So what we do is what's called the allowance method. And the best way to think about this is to actually map it out a little bit as to what happens when. Uh, right. You guys can all see that up the back. You guys can all see this. You guys. All right, so three time periods. So time one, time two, time three. This time period, debit um, accounts receivable. Credit sales revenue. 
Now, obviously sales will happen each and every period, so you'd repeat that, but we're just gonna focus on these sales which happened in this year. So for these sales which happened in this year, that would be the entry, and we're not worried about the amounts involved. The revenue happens in that year, and obviously there would be a cost of goods, if it's, you're selling Inventory, there'd be cost of goods sale happening in that year. If it's not inventory, then it's just sort of other expenses. At time three, you realize that some of these people that you sold inventory, that you sold stuff to, that owed you money, you realize over here, the debt You realize at time three the debt's gone bad. You realize, and it, maybe it happened in time two, like time three is leaving it a long time, but you realize sometime later the debt's gone bad and at that point in time you go, right, we're not gonna get that account receivable because they run off. So we could do this. And I'm stressing this, we could do. So this is just a way to think about it. We could credit account receivable because, and it wouldn't be for the full amount, just whatever amount that we think we're not gonna get back. We credit account receivable. This is the amount that we think is definitely gone. And we debit some sort of expense. Could be a loss, could be an expense, just something which is a negative effect on profit and loss. So what we've effectively done is said, this is when you sold to these guys, so I sold to all of you in time one, and then a couple of you don't pay me back, and I realize that in time three, and that's when the expense rec gets recognized. Now, that looks reasonable. Like, it's not what we do, but it looks reasonable. And the thing, and this is an important point with some of, actually a lot of accounting. So the people who, who make the accounting rules over in London, so this is who make the financial reporting rules, some of the rules that they make, not everyone agrees with. There are some things of the rules that I don't agree with how they go about things. But it's a political process how those rules get put together. So that, in a way, makes a lot of sense. Like, you wait until you figure out it's gone bad and you have the expense then. The position that we actually have, the way that it's done, and again, it has, its, it has justification for it as well, is the expense should happen in the period of time when you sell the item. So this is what this idea, we come up with, a, with an entry at this point. So what we would do is we would debit the expense at this point, so we're matching off these two things. So that's actually what we do do. So we debit an expense and we need to credit something, which we'll get to in a moment. So we debit expense because it matches the revenue expense. So we come up with something here. What that means over here, we'll get to in a moment. The other thing that it does by making it happen in this period is that if you sold a thousand dollars worth, if you had a thousand dollars owing to, but you think you can only get nine hundred and eighty dollars back, you shouldn't show a thousand dollars as your net accounts receivable because you're not going to get all that back. So you should actually show your accounts receivable a little bit less than what it should be. So at this point, you should be showing the fact that you're not going to get everything. And so what we do is we credit. We don't credit the account receivable directly we credit an allowance account, which we'll see in more detail in a moment. And this is a contra account to accounts receivable. So kind of like accumulated depreciation goes with property, plant and equipment. The allowance for bad debts goes with accounts receivable. And so what it does is it shows your accounts, your accounts receivable at the amount that you think you're gonna get. So it's net realizable value. There, so that's the account allowance for bad debts. So the allowance account, which we just talked about, is a contra account with a credit balance. So it has a credit balance. It's subtracted from accounts receivable 
and the difference represents an estimate of the net realizable value of accounts receivable. So accounts receivable less the allowance gives you your net realizable value. So when you open up the financial statements, and if you look up Woolworths and you go to the notes of the accounts, I'm pretty sure they probably have the allowance sitting there as well. That's $730 million odd. That is the net amount. That's not all the people that owe the money. <clears throat> what this slide relates to is this entry. And if you look at it, that made sense when we did it. If you look at it, the, the credit is actually what we've already got up here. So we, credit, we actually get rid of the accounts receivable when we completely write this off. And the debit is the allowance. In effect, what we've done is instead of just having one entry at this point in time, with the expense happening then, and then just the account receivable being reduced then, we split it into two bits. The allowance gets netted out, so we've credited the allowance when we set it up in the same period as the sale, and we debit the allowance when we sell it, oh sorry, when we write it off. And the expense, which we had up here, we've just moved to the period which the sale makes. So the net effect is actually the same. If you, think, if you look at it, we've just taken that and split it out. Conceptually, it's argued to be better because we've got the revenue, the expense matching up in the same time period. And your account receivable net amount has been dropped to show that you're not going to get everything. So it does actually make a lot of sense to do it that way. And this then leads us to the next bit which is we've debited expense credit allowance, but how much? Because this is different from sales. This is, you know, I sell this to Zaki for $10. You haven't paid me yet. Zaki owes me $10. We can see that. We, there's documentation about that. I know that I sold $10 worth of whatever it is and you owe me $10. This is a different setup now to work out the amounts here because this is talking about will or won't Zaki pay me in the future. And we don't know that with, get with any certainty right now. And so if we sell it to one person, you're making a judgment about one. But if you're selling to millions of people, then you can start to run statistical analysis on you know, how many people will pay me when. So the two ways, and these aren't the only ways you could go about doing it, um, but the two big ways we could we, we look at it here, uh, of how much you sell, what percentage of that, or what percentage you sell on a credit basis isn't gonna come back. Or you could look at whatever's in the balance sheet at the end, how much isn't gonna come back. They've both got their pros and cons. Um, there's probably more complicated methods. So percentage of accounts receivable, we just take Regardless of how long that person has owed you money at the end of the year, we just do a single percentage over the top of it. But most businesses will do an aging of accounts. So they'll look at how long at the end of the year, how long has this account been outstanding? And then, you know, if you've been outstanding for a week, you're more likely to get the money off them than if the account has been outstanding for three months or for 12 months. Um, so they sort of build that information in as well. Uh, so if you look at the percentage of sales, you can see it's actually pretty straightforward. So it's the same entry. If you look at the entry first, bad debt expense allowance for bad debts, debit expense credit allowance. Like that's what we have here. All we're worried about what's in the red is how much. $250,000 in sales estimates that 4% will not be collected. 4% of 250 is 10,000. So Debit account receivable, credit sales revenue, 250,000. Debit bad debt expense, credit allowance for bad debts, 10,000. That's it. And if you think about what your um, account receivable will be 250,000. The allowance 
will be 10,000. If this is just uh, the only thing, the information we have, what that will be will be the account receivable of 250 less allowance of 10 gives you 240 account receivable net. So the amount that would be sitting on the, on the balance sheet would be $240,000. Um, as you see, that was pretty simple to do. We've got the revenues and expenses matching up. But it doesn't really, it doesn't take into account what could the closing balance be in, in, um, in the allowance. And then maybe looking at actually how much you have collected. Because what we haven't built in here is that you probably collected some of these accounts over time, like during the year. So this may end up, this $10,000 allowance may actually be a really big percentage of whatever's sitting there and it may not look quite right. So, you know, it's not all positive. The second method is just to look at whatever the balance of the account receivable is. So 24,000, 2% of that will not be collectible and the current balance in the allowance is $200 credit. So we get rid of that for a second. So if we have the allowance and it's got a $200 credit, what we work out is $24,000, 2%, that means the balance, and that's important. What we're calculating, that 2% is not the amount of the bad debt expense. What we're calculating with that 2% is how much the bad debt balance should be. Like we're, we're working out what proportion, what amount of the debts are, gonna, are not gonna be good. So at the end of the year, we're expecting $480 worth of debt not to be collectible. The change is what we need to, between the 200 and the 480. And in that case, that's the 280. So we credit the allowance for bad debts, 280, and we debit the bad debt expense, 280. So again, two ways to go about it, percentage of sales or percentage of um, accounts receivable. The critical thing, you know, this, you need some practice, obviously, sort of working through it and, and, and playing around with these things. But the one thing I just want to draw your attention to from a, from a higher order point of view is that number right there, the 2%. And if we go back to the previous example, this number right here, the 4%. That information is company driven. That information comes from company management and the company accountants looking at their information and going, this is what proportion of things we think are gonna go bad. This is not driven by somebody outside doing it. This is driven by what they're doing. But what's important, I just, uh, and again, I'm not necessarily saying that people do the wrong thing, but you can see the incentive here because that figure, that 280 debit expense, 280 credit allowance 280 that number is based on that 2% figure and that 2% figure has a direct line into an expense number and the expense number has a direct effect on your profitability so if you change that 2% number, that 2% number changes this entry, that entry changes your net profit. So you could see on the margins that if companies, there's a possibility there that you want a slightly higher profit, you change that to 1.5%. You want a slightly lower profit, you change that to 2.5%. Um, again, it's got to go through the auditor so it's not like they could just make something completely up, but there's a little bit of margin for error which they can play around with. Um, I'm not gonna go through this one, but I, this is something for you guys to have a think about is, 
that first bullet point, what if the current balance was not like that, what happens... What happens if the allowance balance was on that side? Why could that have happened? Not for now. Maybe have a think about it, but have a think about, like you'll need to look back at all the entries, all those entries and how they could potentially make that happen. All right. So the next bit we're going to have a look at is inventory. <clears throat> Describe inventory, how it's recorded, expensed and reported. Error in the accounting of inventory affects both the statement of financial position and the statement of comprehensive income. Um, so inventory ends up in two places because the, there's the inventory that you still have at the end of the year, which is in the balance sheet. There's the inventory which you've used up and sold, which goes into the profit and loss statement. So this pen, and this is actually the kind of the interesting thing with accounting, and for, for some of what we're doing here, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference, but in some cases, and I'm thinking very much about financial instruments, the same thing held for different purposes will get treated really, really differently and actually have major bottom line effects. Um, so inventory is a tangible asset. I can touch this pen, it's a tangible asset. It's held for resale. The way that this pen is being used in this context is not inventory because I'm using it in the course of the business. These would be supplies. But for Officeworks or whoever we purchase this off, for Officeworks, this same pen would be inventory. So they buy it from their supplier to sell to us. Um, as I probably mentioned a few weeks ago, Qantas is airplanes. Those airplanes for Qantas are property, plant and equipment. Those, air, some, those same airplanes for Boeing are inventory because they build those airplanes to sell. So the same thing can be treated differently. Intended for resale is a differentiating thing. Okay. This first bit, <coughs> the cost principle. Inventory, and actually it's not just inventory, it's all assets get accounted for at their acquisition cost. Now, maybe I'm just going to speak more to the, I could be wrong with this, maybe more of the guys in the room, but I don't particularly like shopping. I struggle with it. And maybe that's making assumptions about women in the room that they do. So I'm not trying to sort of put myself in these positions, but I don't like shopping. So I buy a lot of stuff. Once I know, you know, I'm going to have to get some new runners shoes, new running shoes soon because mine are sort of getting a bit run down. Um, I don't want to have to go in and buy them in a shop here. I don't want to, I know what size I am. I know what sort of brand and, and what model I like. I'm just going to buy it online. And the thing is, it's actually cheaper for me to buy it online. It's about half the price I can get buying online and it turns up within the week than I buy it in store here in Sydney. So when I buy it, it's overseas based, so you know the shoe, once you've done the financial, once you've done the currency conversion, is about say $100. I'll pay a foreign exchange fee on that because the banks will hit you for that one and a half, two percent um, on top of the margin they take on the, on the currency change anyway. So I'm gonna pay probably $2 or so gets added up by my credit card company on top of that. Then I'll pay 10 or so dollars in shipping. Um, so all of those costs get added up before it gets to me. So it turns up, I've actually ended up spending about $112 on shoes, which to the supplier cost 100 in terms of what I give them. The acquisition cost includes when I debit inventory, when I debit the asset, is everything that I spend to get that shoe from England to me. I could just give the supplier $100 but it doesn't do me any good because the shoes are still in England. So those other costs are absolutely relevant for me because it gets those shoes to me. So the shoe to me is debit asset $112, credit cash $112. It's not debit asset 100, debit FX change fee expense 
two, debit, shipping cost 10. It's everything loaded up, um, which is what we're saying here. Now, when we get to this, we're going to use a perpetual method. Um, and that just means, and this will make sense as we do some of the examples, we update everything every time something's sold. We don't just do it all at the year end. So every time something is going on, every time something is purchased in, we update the system. Uh, the recording of inventory is relatively straightforward here. Um, so debit inventory, 20,000, credit accounts payable, 20,000. So again, these are me buying my shoes, inventory. This is me paying for shipping of my shoes, debit inventory. This is me having a whinge to the supplier because there was a mark on the shoes and I get a discount off it, credit inventory. This is me getting a discount because I paid them really promptly, credit inventory. It all feeds through inventory because that's all related to the cost of getting that inventory to me. Um, for this particular one, working out the 190, if you're not too sure what to do, you owed them $19,000 and now you don't. So $19,000 has to disappear. So you have to debit accounts payable 19,000. The cash, the amount that you paid is 99% of that. So $18,810. So that's cash going out of your business. That's the credit. What you're left with is a gap of 190. That's a credit because that's what you need to put in there. And it's a credit inventory because it's a reduction in the price you have to pay for the shoes. So that's why it's the inventory that gets put in. Uh, so when we end up with it, we end up with an amount on the balance sheet. So this would all net out to be debit inventory 19,110. But realistically, that's actually the easy bit of this whole perp of this whole kind of section is just we add in all these costs, boom, that's how much we've got. The expensing inventory is the actual entries we've seen before. Debit cash credit sales or debit accounts receivable, and then we have to worry about bad debts, credit sales. This amount, 600, is how much you guys have paid for that product. Credit cost of goods sold, so debit cost of goods sold, credit inventory, that's how much is the value of the inventory we sold. This is where the problems start. The, entries, the entry is what the entry is. We debit, ex so debit expense, credit asset. This is debit asset, credit revenue. That's all straightforward, the actual debits and credits. What's an issue? That's straightforward because we know off the invoices and the receipts, that's how much. This is the problem, the 400. We've just been given it here, but in reality, that's not always as easy to figure out. Um, So with this, we'll have to sort of talk about why this is. There are four costing methods. Now, you are going to have to remember, you're going to have to know three of them. The fourth, I'll talk about why you don't have to remember it as we get to it. But probably more important than just knowing how to do them, which you will need to do, is knowing what they actually represent and why we need to use them in the first place. In a perfect world, in a world where we had great information and it flowed through properly and companies could track this stuff, everyone would use specific identification. But that's not the world we live in. So what specific identification means is that when, I don't know where the university bought this from, I'm just going to assume Officeworks, but when the university bought this this pen, I'm not talking about a pen which is like this pen, I'm talking about this specific one which I hold in my hand. When the university bought this pen from Officeworks, Officeworks knows absolutely how much this, this pen, not one that looks like it, but this pen cost. 
because they have lots of these types of pens and they have, they'd have a whole shelves of exactly this pen. And maybe the transport cost allocated to this pen might be slightly different. Maybe the supplier charged some of those pens slightly more or they managed to get some on discount, I don't know. But it's odds on that every single pen in Officeworks's, Officeworks's warehouse did not cost the same. So then specific identification is saying, you know this, this one right here, I know how much this costs. And you don't know that. Some cases, some companies will. If you're a car dealer, you know how much, when a car drives off the lot, you know how much that particular vehicle cost. For jewelry, they'll probably know, if they're not Michael Hill type jewelers, but if you're talking like proper kind of, you know, more high-end jewelers, they will know what particular pieces cost. If you're talking about, you know, other types of products which are very individual in nature, or, or if you have an incredibly good inventory management system. So software products, you might be able to get away with that because they might know with barcodes and whatnot that exactly that copy of Microsoft Office, and we're not they don't sell them like that anymore, but that copy costs them this, then they could probably track it through. But that's not always the case. So what we have is a situation where we have first in, first out. Because it's the same with Woolworths. If you go into Woolworths, now think about, if you go into Woolworths and you buy four cans of tinned tomatoes, you're making a bolognese, we're doing something. Four cans of tinned tomatoes, all from the same brand, because they sell a couple of different brands now, all from the same brand. They may well cost slightly different amounts to Woolworths. The suppliers might have been different, like in terms of their pricing. There is no way Woolworths can know the cost of the tins that you have in your you have in your basket. There's no way they could know that. The barcodes on all four of those tins are exactly the same. So when you scan them, they're just the same. Like it's, they don't differentiate for each tin. But even on top of that, if you think about think about behaviorally how we because now they force us all to go through self service checkouts. If you have multiple items and you're scanning them, okay, this is actually quick. If you've got multiple items, think about when the last time you do it and you're scanning them, do you scan the same item multiple times or do you scan each individual item? Same item. Yeah, you scan the same item. We're lazy. You just go, yeah, scan it through. So you'd be scanning the same, even if they were individually barcoded, we're scanning the same item four times. So they wouldn't even know the other three had left. So I don't think it's even possible for Woolworths to know exactly what items. So they don't do that. Now, this is jumping ahead a little bit, um, but we're going to talk about first in, first in, first out, last in, first out, and moving average. So we saw with Woolworths, they had about $4.6 billion of inventory in their books. That's how much, that's a snapshot, that's the 30th of June 2016, that's how much inventory they had. Some of that inventory is going to be milk. They have milk up the back fridge in every store. so. They'll have you know, quite a few litres of milk in every store around the country. That'll add up a bit. My question to you is the following. They buy milk all through the year. They buy milk, they'll have milk they purchase on the 1st of July 2015 through September, October, November, whatnot. And they'll have bought milk on the 30th of June 2016. The milk which is represented in the balance sheet amount of 4.6 billion. It's not going to be a big number, it's going to be quite small. The amount which is in that number, where do you think it was purchased? Do you think it was purchased at the start of the year, sometime during the year, or kind of late or right at the end of the year? And this isn't a trick question, this is just a, genu a genuine when was the most likely time that milk was purchased. Really? End of the year. Does anyone believe the milk in the fridge on the 30th of June 2016 was purchased on the 1st of July 2015? Jeez, I'd hope not. I'd really hope it wasn't. 
Um, look, you know, I'll go in and I'll, you know, f I don't buy that much milk nowadays, but you know, you go in, you you look for, through the dates and you find the the most recent one. You take that. So you wouldn't be taking the oldest milk which is in the fridge. You try to take the newest. But I'm pretty sure I'd be kind of worried if there was still milk from the start of the year still in the fridge at the end of the year. So everyone, I think, is pretty comfortable with the fact that the milk at the end of the year is pretty much the last stuff that they bought in. So when you think about that, the reverse of that idea is if the stuff that, the, that they've still got is the stuff that they purchased at the end, the stuff which they're selling was the stuff they sold at the start of the year. So it's the first things that they buy are the first things that they sell. So they buy milk in the 1st of July, it would generally get sold around the 1st or 2nd of July. The stuff they buy in September is generally what they bought in in September and so on and so on. That is first in, first out. That is the stuff that you buy at the start of the year is the first stuff that you sell. Meaning the stuff that you've got left is the last stuff that you bought. Last in, first out is the flip of that. Last in, first out assumes what's in the fridge at the end of the year is from the 1st of July. 2015. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And that's not what happens. Last in, first out doesn't make a lot of sense for a lot of products. So last in, first out actually you cannot use in Australia. Last in, first out you can basically not use anywhere in the world apart from the United States. Um, maybe because they've got a lot less perishable food because it's all just junk and they can have it whenever they want. I don't know. But FIFO works well for perishable goods because generally speaking, you're not going to have it for a long period of time. The first you buy in is what goes out the door and so on and so on and so on. Last in, first out, in terms of sales, works the other way. The last method that we have is kind of a bit mixed in that it's moving, it's, it takes an average. Now, it's not just a general entire yearly average because the key word there is it's a moving average. So what happens is we'd have a pool of whatever this inventory is costing us a certain amount. As we add more inventory in, we just make the pool a little bit bigger and then just average out that entire cost. As we sell it, we just shrink the pool and we make the pool bigger. We don't worry about exactly when things were sold. We just sort of average it all out through the year. Now, we'll see how that works with some numbers because that'll start to make more sense. Um, so when the perpetual method, which is what we're using, COGS needs to be calculated each time inventory is sold. Some firms are able to, to specifically identify the cost of the inventory sold if you've got serial numbers, tags, registrations, etc. So, you know, electronics could work well with that. Certainly not produce. Um, more commonly, however, firms need to make an assumption to calculate the cost of the inventory sold. So FIFO inventories first to cost a good sold, which is what we just talked about. LIFO, inventories purchased last to cost a good sold, not permitted here. And moving average assigns the average cost of the units purchased. Um, and look, when we do the example, we'll see all of that, which is what we're about to do. So this information, um, I'm going to make the assumption that you have all of this in front of you, because uh, we're going to have to move to Excel to do some of what we're about to do. Um, Assume that Wombat General Store sells a specialty Goanna oil that it purchases from Din Dingo Manufacturing. The following is Wombat's inventory activity for September. So we have a number of things happen. And this, you know, they may be more regular purchases or more, more regular sales, but this is, this is the information we have. We had an amount, we had 40 units at the start of the, start of the month. We purchased 60 a few days later. We made a sale of 65. We then purchased another 30, purchased another 45, sold. 50. Now what I'm going to do, um, I was going to say, we're, although we are making good time, what I'm, mm, we'll do this fully through and just see how we're going for time. Um, so the way to set this up, as I'm about to do in Excel, is not the way you have to set it up. You could do this a different way if you want, but it, it is a way to do it. Um, but before we even jump into that, Let's just take some of this information here and look at what we're dealing with.
OK, so if we, let's first up add up all the units that we had that we've either started with or we've purchased. So we've got 40 and 60 gives you 100, plus 30 gives you 130, plus 45 gives you 100. OK, so we've had 175 units. If we had sold nothing, we'd have 175 units. If we add up all the cost of those units, so they had different unit costs each time, someone may want to double check this number for me, but $2,355. So that's how much all the inventory that we had at, at, over the course of this month, that's how much it cost us. We had 175 units costing in total $2,355. Now what we've done is we've sold 115 units. And what we have left in inventory is the difference of that, which is 60 units. And what you've noticed is I've not added dollars to either of those things. We started with 175 units. The total cost of that was 2,355. We've sold 115. We've got left in inventory 60. That's the state of play. What we need to do is to add a dollar figure to both of those because financial statements, as we saw in week one, are, have currency units. We don't have, we have this many apples and this many oranges and try to put them all in a financial statement. We need the dollar figures attached. So to do that, uh, there's one more, oh sorry, there's one thing I just want to add. So this, what goes in here, this is your cost of goods sold. So that's in your profit and loss statement. The inventory is an asset in the balance sheet. Um, so that's where each of these things ends up. What we're going to do, and we're going to do it in two different ways, not four, is to work out a cost of goods sold figure and an inventory figure for this. And actually what I might do, because I actually want to leave something for you guys to do it, is I'm only going to do up to, and not for you to do in class right now, I'm just going to do 1st of September to 15th of September um, for both the, for the two methods. And that leaves you to be able to do the final purchase and sale. And because you've got the information there with you, you can cross check that with the information, like with the solutions as you go through. Okay, so we can all see, yep, yeah, we can all see that. So what we have here, this is the handout that you received. I think it was blank. Yeah, no, it was blank, so I'm filling this in. Look, as I said, this is a way to do it. So what I've set it up is on the 1st of September, it was the opening amount. We had 40 units, $12 a unit. That adds up to a cost of 480. Um, oh, it wasn't a handout I gave to you, it was a handout on, um, online. So the balance under FIFO, so we're doing it under first in, first out. So the balance of what's in the Im in inventory is $40 at $12 a unit gives you $480. On the 4th of September, we had a purchase and we purchased 60 units at $13 a unit gives us We've spent $780 buying additional units. Now, what I want you to see here is I'm not going to aggregate these. I'm going to keep them as two separate blocks. So in terms of what's in inventory and in the balance, I've got 100 units. At 1260.
So we take that, and the next transaction we have is on the 10th of September, and we have sale. Now the amount that we sell is 65 units. Now being first in, first out, the units that we sell first are the ones from the start of the year. So the first 40 units that we sell are the 40 units from the start of the year, so the $12 units. The next 25 units are the next ones. And there's only 25 of them, and there, we had 60, so 25 is less than that. So 25 at 13 gives us 325. Um, when we add this together, To date, that's not the total cost of goods. But up, if we were to draw a line off at this point in time, our cost of goods sold, our cost of goods sold would be $805. Because we're assuming we're selling the first 40, then the next 25, and so on. Um, what we've got left in terms of a balance, we've got none of the 40, we've got none of the $12 units left. Um, of the $60, of the $13 units, we have 35 left at $13. Gives you $455. So the balance would be thirty-five units in in inventory, of which they account to four hundred and fifty-five dollars. Now I just want to show you something really quickly. When we add what's in the balance with cost of goods sold, it's a 1260. So what we've effectively done is take this amount here in 1260 and split it up into the cost of goods sold and in terms of what's left in the inventory balance. Um, and that's, when you keep going with it, that's effectively what happens. So we're just, the final entry I will do is a purchase. And we purchase, how many do we purchase? 30, I think it is. 30 at 14 gives you 420. And what we have here in terms of balance is 35 at 13. And we have 30 at 14 gives us $420. Add those two together and we have $875 for a certain number of units. Right. And you just keep repeating that process. Um, from a graphical point of view, so that, in some sense that looks quite convoluted. I mean, it isn't, but you just need to sort of sequentially build it up. What we've effectively done is the following. This is the start of the year. We, we had 40. We then buy 60. So those are the units, those are the units that we purchased. We then sell Those are the units that we sell. We sell 65. And we work our way up. We work up, we sell the 40, then we just go to wherever we stop. And then from that point in time, we sort of start again, and we have 35. We have the 35 units, and we add um, the 30 units. And then the final purchase is, how much is that? 45. And then we add another one, 45 over the top. And we just keep working up as we go through. The sale which takes place right at the end is 50. So from this point, 35, that covers that, and then it goes about halfway up here.
and then you'd start again. So you've then got a block of 15 and a block of 45. So from a, a slightly different way to think about it is you sell up, you, you buy up, then you sell off, get rid of them, and then you start afresh. You've got 35 units that you started with, add up the 30, add up the 45, then sell 50 of them, then you start afresh. You've got 15 units left of whatever the dollar price units they are, and then 45, and you just keep going like that. So you work your way up, um, is a way to think about it. The second method that we have is the weighted average. Now, the weighted average does it, and I'll do the graphical representation first um, to pick this up. So that's FIFO. Weighted average does this. It's so it's the same units. Now, that's a really important thing to think about. We're not talking about different product. We're just talking the same thing, just being modeled differently. So we've got 40 units, and then we buy 60. Those are 60 units at 13. Those are 40 units at 12. That's right. Yep. From a weighted average perspective, they become combined. We mix them up. We work out whatever the weighted average cost of these units are, and they just become one whole homogeneous mass. Then we sell off 65 of them. So then we have 35, and we have 30. And they become, a, they become a homogeneous mass. And you've got a weighted average, the cost of those units. And then we add 65 plus, how much do we get in at the top? 45. And they become a mass of 110 units. And we just keep doing that process. Um, so the difference is this, we keep them very discrete, the units, and we just sell up through them. With this, we combine, once we've made a purchase, we combine them, work out the weighted average of what's there, sell off a bit, we have 35, we buy 30, we combine them, we get 65, we buy 45, we combine them, and then we just keep going that way. We'll see that now with numbers. So with the 1st of September, that's what we've got. On the 4th of September, we purchase something and we purchase 60 units, $13 a unit, it gives you 780. Now this is what I'm talking about. We don't keep them separate. We actually amalgamate them all. So we've got 100 units now, which is that big merged block. And the total price is 1,260. Then once we've got that, we can work out what the unit price is, which is the total price divided by quantity. So that 1260 is a calculated number. That is the weighted average. So that is, um, and it's not, it's not a simple average because it's not 13 plus 12, the average of that is $12.50 because there's more of the $13 units. So it's a weighted average based on the fact that you've got more $13 units than you do have $12 units. We then, on the 10th of September, make a sale of 65 units. So the quantity we sell is 65. We use the unit, that unit price, and we end up with 819. That's your cost of goods sold, that 819. That's the cost of goods sold under this method. What you're left with is 100 minus 65 at $12.60. Oops. Um, 
and that's that amount, the 441, is the ending balance of the inventory. When you come to the second purchase, we purchase how much? 30 at 14 gives us 420. We just add this in. So we now have 65 units plus the 420. 65 units, which cost us $861 based on what we're doing here. And you have a closing balance at this point of $861. And you just keep repeating that process. Um, I just want you to keep your eye on the cost of goods sold of 819. So weighted average, the cost of goods sold was 819. The cost of goods sold here was 805. So FIFO in this case has a lower cost of goods sold. And that makes sense because we're assuming we're selling the cheaper goods first because it goes up in terms of prices. So we're selling the cheaper goods first. So it'll have a lower cost of goods sold. Whereas this one sort of mixes it all together. So it'll bring up, bring up that cost of goods sold a little bit. Um, so you can actually have the same underlying thing have very different outcomes. Um, oh yeah. So. We'll All right. So that's inventory. What I do with it is whether this helped, I, like I hope it does because it helps you kind of picture what's happening. But without stuff, it is about just rolling up the sleeves and running some calculations on it. Um, the last thing that we're going to turn to is property, plant and equipment, um, recorded, expense and reported. The acquisition is fairly straightforward. The acquisition of property, plant and equipment we've seen already, and it's actually also quite similar to inventory. Property, plant and equipment are tangible resources that are expected to be used in the normal course of operations for more than one year and is not intended for resale. So the things which we're standing in, the things which we're sitting in, the things we're sitting on, the things we're watching, the things we're typing on, these are all property, plant and equipment. These are things we're going to use for more than one year. In terms of the cost of acquiring them, it's the same idea as inventory. Everything that you use to get it to where you need it to be. So in this case, we have a company buying a delivery truck and they pay purchase price, they pay import duties, they pay stamp duties, they pay for a GPS system because that's what's going to be used with the truck. It's going to be a delivery truck, so it needs it for what it's doing. Um, these all get included in the asset cost. Registration and insurance. Now this is where insurance definitely, you know, you could argue, well, we can't really use it if it's not registered, but then registration you use up over time. So, you know, it's, it's a sort of this, that, and the other. I mean, well, actually insurance, if it's an insurance cost, arguably wouldn't be an expense, it would be an asset, but not an asset to this asset. It would be an asset on itself. It would be a prepaid insurance. So. The key is though, it doesn't get put into this asset for depreciation purposes. That's more to the point. So we have a truck and when you add up all those numbers, we end up with $65,000. If I write over here, Radhika, can you see? Oh, no. You guys can't see this. If I, can you guys see this? Sort of, all right, so that's too far across. Just don't want to get rid of that. Um, now, I'll leave that, I'll get rid of this bit. All right, so we have a truck. Uh, how much does this cost? 65000 So we have a truck and it costs $65,000. The entry for this is debit PPE, or you could debit truck or debit machinery or whatever you want to call it, credit cash. 
or accounts payable or whatever. That's an asset, that's an asset. If that's the only thing we do with it, there's no profit and loss effect. But we use that truck in the course of the business. If we never had a profit or loss effect, they, they, it was like it wasn't used. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So what PPE, what depreciation does is allocate, let me talk about it here, maybe later on, or well, there it is, third point, allocates it over its useful life. So if we've got the 65,000, and we take it and we divide up the cost and we work out a little bit of cost for each year of its useful life. Now that then begs a couple of things that we need to work, begs a couple of questions. How long is this useful life? What do we end up with? How do we actually make this allocation happen? And we talked about this a bit last week. Um, importantly though, depreciation has nothing to do with market value. Depreciation is about the allocation process. Um, the depreciation entry that you have each year is debit depreciation expense credit accumulated depreciation. That will always be like that. It will always be the same entry. It will always be debit depreciation expense credit accumulated depreciation. Um, accumulated depreciation goes with property plant and equipment and takes away from its carrying value takes away from its gross amount to get a carrying value but this is where the interesting bits lie because there's four pieces of information we need to know we have one already we have the cost of the truck and even that, there's some elements of, well, do you include this in it? Do you not include this? But let's just assume that's pretty solid, that number of 65,000. That's cost. We need to know life. So in this case, we're going to say five years. So we're going to use this truck for five years. We then need to have a figure about, well, how much is this going to be worth at the end? Because if we think it's going to be worth nothing, we need to allocate 65,000 over five years. If we think it's going to be worth something less than, more than nothing, then we don't have to allocate 65. We could allocate slightly less because we, we're rolling down to a, a higher point. So let's come up with 15,000. So we think in five years time, truck's going to be worth $15,000. What that tells you is over five years, we need to depreciate $50,000. And the last piece of information we need is we've got $50,000 that we need to depreciate. How do we get that into those years? What's it? 10,000. Yeah, that's a pretty straightforward and obvious way to do it. And that is a way you can do it, which is we use what's called the straight line method and just go, we go from this point, which is 65, down to this point, which is 15. We do it over five years, that's $10,000 a year. And that's the first way we do it. So when we come to that method, we don't even really need to go through it because we already know it. But it's not the only way we can do it. Because I'd throw to you, well, what happens if the truck has a lifespan based on kilometers? And what happens if the kilometers get used more in one year than another year? because maybe it was really rainy one year and didn't really get used. So what happens if it, if it has, it did like 80% of its life in terms of kilometers in one of those five years? Then it would make sense for the more depreciation to be in that year than the other years. So there are other ways we can do this. But actually, even before we get to the types of methods, I just want you to sort of take a, take a bigger picture view of this. This number we kind of know for certain. And I say kind of because we, having now done cost, we can see that it's, it's not always straightforward what number goes in here. But for our purposes, that's going to be a fairly straightforward thing. So let's assume that's a given. This number is an estimate. This number is management saying at the start of the, the, at this point, we think it's going to be in five years worth this. It could be a good estimate. It could be a shocking estimate. It's an estimate. Useful life. Could be five years, could be four years, could be 10 years. We've come up with five. Again, it's an estimate. 
the method that we choose, do we use straight line? Do we use some sort of reducing balance method? Do we use some method which bases it on kilometers driven? Do we do something else? There's, there's, op there's options out there. Now, I've given you guys a handout. The, the income statement for Qantas and the notes, of the, financial, the notes of the financial statements. There are three numbers on the income statement. Look at the income statement first. There are three numbers. I just want you to circle. This is just for context. So this is from Qantas with financial statements six years ago. But there's a reason for this. Revenue and other income up the top. In bold, $14.894 billion. So let's just round that off and say their revenue they made was about $15 billion. If you then go into expenditure, fourth line down in expenditure, what you'll see is depreciation and amortization of $1.2 billion. So that is their depreciation expense. That is when they do that each year, or when they do that this year, de debit depreciation expense, the total amount for depreciation and amortization for Qantas in 2011 was $1.249 billion. Touch under 10% of their total revenues. It's over a billion dollars. Like this is not a small number. The third number I want you to look at is the statutory profit for the year. If you go down the bottom, it's the second bottom number that you can see. You can either, yeah, so statutory profit for the year is $249 million. Keep those, keep those three numbers in mind. And then I want you to have a look at the notes to the financial statements. Now this is actually what the important bit in relation to this is, but I wanted you to have a look at the context of how profitable they were and how much revenue they had before we look at this bit. I want you to have a look at, this is from the notes of the financial statements, I want you to look at the bottom left corner. And I'll read this out. Change in accounting estimates, passenger aircraft residual value. So what they are saying, and they, I'm not, and I, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting there's any issue with what they've done. This is completely above board. It's disclosed. Auditors signed off on it. They have good reason to do it. I'm not suggesting that at all. All I'm saying is if you didn't look at the notes, if you just looked at the income statement, you'd have no idea that this has happened. What we're talking about here is that number. When I'm talking about the truck, we're talking about that residual value. From 1st of January 2010, the estimated res residual values of passenger aircraft were revised to between nil and 10% of acquisition cost. The estimated residual values had been between nil and 20%. These changes res resulted in an increase, an increase in depreciation expense of $93 million. An increase in expense of $93 million means profit is, has dropped by $93 million over what it would otherwise have been. So if we go back to the income statement, now, I actually tell a lie. Maybe the 249 isn't the best place to look at because that depreciation is pre-tax. So let's say they get, although we don't know the tax, how, the, how they're being taxed on it. Let's even say that we look at the statutory profit before income tax expense. That's 323. That's about $100 million lower than what it would have been had they not made that change. That's a big change. That's like a 25% change in their profit. It would have been about 400 and something. Instead, it's 300 and something. We're not talking about like, you know, a dollar or two here or there. Like this is a substantial amount. If you weren't aware that that was the case, and you compare the bottom line profit of 116 the last year to 249, things have got better. They should have been a lot better if they'd used exactly the same method, which is kind of interesting. Um, so anyway, that was, I just thought that was an interesting thing to bring up because it shows you that these things do get changed. The second thing I wanted you to look at very quickly, and it relates not to depreciation so much, but actually to this figure right here, the 65,000. Top right hand corner, 
change in accounting estimates, major cyclical maintenance costs for operating leased aircraft. You can spend days reading this stuff and it's, you find interesting tidbits. Maybe that's just me. Um, historically, the cost of major cyclical maintenance checks for operating leased aircraft were expensed as incurred. Now think about that for a second. We know what that entry is. So when they have repairs on whatever it happens to be, they would debit expense, credit cash. That's what used to be. Um, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, from 1st of July, 2010, the Qantas Group has capitalized and depreciated the cost of these checks. What they're saying is they've moved from debit expense, credit cash, debit asset, credit cash. And again, nothing wrong with that. They've told us about it. They have a reason for it. Auditors, auditors are fine with it. So I'm not saying there's a problem with it. I'm just saying be aware of this stuff, especially if you're not necessarily going into a preparation role. If you're looking at, at these sort of companies on an investment role, be aware of the things which are affecting the, the accounting numbers. Last paragraph in that little block on the right-hand corner. This change resulted in 50, 50 five zero million of maintenance costs being capitalized in property, plant and equipment net of depreciation. The effect of this change in the current year profit and loss was an increase in depreciation expense of five million. Well, that makes sense. You've got more assets, so you're depreciating a bigger number, so depreciation will go up. And a decrease in aircraft operating variable expense of 55 million. So basically that one change, change a debit expense to a debit asset, you don't have an expense anymore, your profit goes up. And their profit went up by 50 million because of that change. So again, looking at the income statement, 249, 50 million dollars increased purely because of a change in how they do that. Like that's a 20% change. Be aware of this stuff. That's all I'm getting at. You know, MBA students, be aware of this stuff. MPA students, you're gonna look at this stuff in more detail anyway. Um, other students, if you're going down, you know, finance students, whatnot, if you're analyzing companies, there's tidbits sitting behind that it's useful to look at. And it's also why people don't trust accounting numbers because we can change stuff. Um, anyway. Sort of gone off on a bit of a tangent, but I thought it would be interesting to look at it in a real world setting. So there are tons of different ways and it was Ari's that mentioned straight line. Yes? That's your, it's ours, isn't it? Yeah. Excellent. One down, 39 to go. No, I'm better than, I think I'm figuring out who people are. So we focus on three methods, straight line. We've already done. We already know how to do that. Like that's very, very easy. Reducing balance and units of activity of the new ones. Straight line, we've talked about, spreads it evenly across. Um, this is using the same information that we use, like I did that on purpose, um, so that it would link. 65 down to 15 over five year use for life, straight line depreciation, 10,000 per year. Debit depreciation, expense credit, accumulated depreciation. What is the carrying amount? So when we refer to a carrying amount, we refer to what is carried on the books. So if a carrying amount of anything, a liability, an asset, whatever it happens to be, is whatever is on the books. And that's net of the accumulated depreciation. So after one year, it's 55. What I just want you to look at in terms of this is the depreciation expense for straight line is the same $10,000 each year. The accumulated depreciation, the hint is in this first word, it accumulates. 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, you're building up, you're adding all the depreciation expenses in that happen. The carrying amount is the difference between the cost and the accumulated depreciation. So 65, 55, 45, 35, 25, and you'll notice we get to 15 at the end. That's the point. So those are what I was talking about. Reducing balance. If we were to map out straight line, if this is straight line depreciation expense, 10,000 a year, reducing balance is gonna look something like that. 
It's going to be more earlier on, and then it's going to be less later on. But importantly, it will still be $50,000 in total. We're just putting it in different places. Um, that looks kind of scary. You know, I haven't done maths in a while. Look, we'll get to what, how we actually do this properly. So how we do it is work out the straight line rate. And the straight line rate is 100% divided by the number of years that you're doing it over. So in this case, it's five years. So it's one, one divided by five or 20%. You take that 20% and you multiply it by whatever multiplier we give you. So if we tell you it's 1.5 times, multiply it by 1.5. In this case, we tell you it's double. So you multiply it by two. So 20% times two gives you 40%. So what you were doing is reducing the balance by 40, is showing the depreciation expense of 40% of the carrying value each period. You don't worry about the residual value when you calculate it. So 65 is the carrying value at the start times by the 40%. That gives you 26,000. So the depreciation expense in year one is 26,000. Debit that, credit that, 26,000. And what you'll see is the calculation, the 40% is consistent all the way through. What changes is the amount we're doing it by. So it's the carrying value that we come in on. So we started with 65, that's the starting carrying amount. 65 minus the, depreci the depreciation expense, which becomes accumulated, gives you 39. 39 is then what you multiply by 40%. That gives you 15.6. That gives you a carrying amount of 23.4. Then you take 23.4 and you take 40% of that. And you keep doing that up until, and this is the trick with this one, up until accumulated depreciation is $50,000. You cannot have a carrying amount less than $15,000. And if that means that you've got to adjust, I don't know if that actually is 8,400, I think it probably isn't. If this number, what you calculate, even if it's, if it's too big, then you only take it down to 50. So you just be careful of that very last couple of entries, just where you end up. 39, 23 to 4. Whoop. All right. The last one that we have is one not based on time. Because units, oh sorry, straight line and reducing balance is allocating across the five years. What units of activity does is actually look at how you use something. And so with a truck, it might be on kilometers that you drive. So the number of kilometers that you drive is how you depreciate it. So in this case, what we see is the information is a little bit different. The truck has a residual value of 15 and a life of 100,000 kilometers. We're not time anymore. So what we're doing is working out depreciation at 50 cents a kilometer. So for every kilometer we drive, we knock off, we have a depreciation expense of 50,000. 50 cents. So you do 24,000 kilometers, that's 12,000 of depreciation expense in that year. And then what you'll see, we have 22,000 Ks, 27, 17, 10. So the depreciation expense bounces around, but it still ends up at 50. Um, so that's all that we've done there. So the total is, is 100,000 kilometers. Total expense is 50,000 kilometers, which is what we wanted. And that's units of activity. So it's just a slightly different way of doing it. So the thing I just want you to note, a couple of key things, is straight line depreciation, the total depreciation expense is 50. Reducing balance, the total is 50. Units of activity, the total is 50. Doesn't matter which method you choose the total amount is going to be the same. All that we're changing is when it happens. Um, yeah, no method is right or wrong, just different. Companies choose a method based on different reasons. 
they should really be choosing, and the standards sort of require them to do this, they should really be choosing a method which best fits how they use that asset. That's actually how they should be doing it. But there's obviously scope to use slightly different ones. Um, uh, all right, one final comment before we get into that and then we'll wrap it up. A question you may have, and it's a probably fit, some of you may have, a lot of you may have, none of you may have, and just be hoping to get to the long weekend, I don't know, is, what happens, let's look at the last example, what happens if they drive more than 100,000 kilometers? What happens if the useful life is longer than five years? You are allowed and companies are allowed to change those estimates. So we just saw with Qantas, Qantas changed the residual value. Now a comment on that is, and you, this isn't for this subject, this is just as, as, a, as an aside. If it wasn't an error, if you just get to the point of views down the track and you realize, oh we could use them for a few more years. All you do is you just look at where you're at and you change the rate and just change it going forward. You don't touch what has happened in the past. So you can change an estimate and it just changes things that happen in the future. You don't go back and change all your old accounting. So you can have things where that number gets changed. Um, the very final thing we'll have and a very easy thing is how do you record a disposal of property, plant, and equipment? Now, key kind of point on that, disposal, not sale. You can dispose of an asset by just chucking it out. Like it doesn't have to be necessarily sold. Um, record any depreciation expense, so bring up the depreciation to where it needs to be, then calculate the gain or loss, and then throw in the journal entry. Easier if we actually see it. We have a car with Cost is 25,000, so that's in the accounts at 25. Accumulated depreciation of 15,000, so that's in the account at 15,000. We get 6,000 cash. What we have to do is the following. That car account, take it to zero. Credit car, 25,000. The accumulated depreciation account has a credit balance. Take that to zero. Debit, accumulated depreciation, 15,000. We have cash coming into the business. Debit cash, 6,000. Once you've got this, this one, this one, and this one, if they balance, you don't have a gain, you don't have a loss, you, that's it. If they don't balance, you need a debit or a credit number in there to make it work out. In this case, you need debit 4,000. And if it's a debit, it's a loss. If it's a credit, it's a gain. Um, so if they just dump this car, they wouldn't have any cash of 6,000. So it would just be debit accumulated depreciation, credit car, and debit loss on disposal 10. That's what you're picking up. Um, that's getting rid of something. Like just getting the accounts for that asset and the accumulated depreciation down at zero, and then whatever cash or other consideration is coming in, show that, and then any gain or loss, show that. Um, that's it.